This is our second session of the So You've Written the Novel, Now What panel. Um, in fact, we have the mastermind of the panel right here, so I'll be Nash, who I will introduce first. Yes. He is the award-winning author, he writes novels, comic books, short stories, graphic novels, and the occasional screenplay. Wow. He is a member of the International Association of Media Tie-In Writers and International Thriller Writers. On occasion, Bobby appears in movies and TV shows, usually standing somewhere behind your favorite actor. For more information on Bobby and his work, please visit him at bobbynatta.com. We also have Ruby Bless Johnson, who is a physicist and author and the principal investigator for the Near Earth Asteroid Scout Solar Sail Mission. It is the solar sail. Yes. Visual aids. It is. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> The Solar Sail mission at NASA's George C. Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville. I'm having fun getting rid of having to say all that. Uh, Les's latest novel, Mission to Methany, was published in February 2018 by Bain Books. He is also the author of multiple popular science nonfiction books, including the recent the recently released Crap. Graphene. Graphene. I don't, why, I don't know why that word doesn't yeah. have graphene. Well, it's not an everyday vocabulary. Yeah. The super strong, super thin, and super versatile material that will revolutionize the world. We have Katherine Asaro, who is the author of over 30 books. She earned her doctorate in theoretical chemical physics from Harvard. She currently directs the Chesapeake Math Program and has coached numerous math teams, including ones for math competitions at Harvard, MIT, Princeton, Math Council, as well as individual students in such events as the USA Mathematical Olympiad. Her latest novel is The Bronze Skies, and it'll be published from Maine. And last but certainly not least, we have Edward Warren. Edward Warren is a reader, writer, and YouTube content creator who has worked in every facet of the publishing industry, from editing, to cover design, to writing, and criticism for the past 15 years. He's been writing professionally since 2011, and his most recent horror novel, The Betting of Boys, is due out August 18th. And so, I'd like to thank you all for participating, and I'm sure Bobby has has good <coughs> things to say, so um, I was, if you want to ask the first question with other authors there right now. Um, sure. Um, well, uh, the, 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 the genesis of this, the idea, mm -hmm. uh, we did it in a panel once, because they were just looking for ideas and we threw this out. And basically it was just, who's here at the con? Okay, I know this person and this person, and we just grabbed them. And I realized as we're talking, which is a generic writing, just being a writer panel. And I got noticing, sitting there, that we all were different types of writers. Like one was traditionally published, one was self-published. You know, I'm, I'm kind of a hybrid, I'm, I'm in the middle. So we, we, we kind of went in that direction of, because we get a lot of questions, and you guys probably get the same questions, like, okay, what do, I don't know what to do with it once I've written it. How do you get published? That's a, you know, people won't, you know. There's just a lot of confusion, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of options these days. So this, this idea kind of comes out of letting you see the path that we all took, or why we took that path, is, you know, what path do we wish we'd take it if we don't like the path we took, or things like that. So it's, with the, with the knowledge of people who have written and published in different methods, can give you guys more of a, a, a wider understanding of your publishing options. So that, that was the genesis of it. So um, I guess the first question I would ask is, uh, first uh, tell them you know, how you got published, or which, which route you took, whether traditional or self, or whatever, whatever, you know, path you had, and, and why you chose that path. You know, start on the end? Yeah, sure. Um, I am almost 100% uh, independently published. Um, I do all of my own covers, my formatting. Um, I do hire out for editing because I don't trust myself with typos and such. Um, but the reason I took the path, oh, I say almost 100% is because there is, I do have publishers that, that publish uh, traditionally the hardcover of the novel, whether it be the limited edition, but then I will go and I will get the ebook, the ebook, the audiobook. I have retained the rights to those and to uh, the paperback. So when I do the paperback release, uh, it's all me. Um, the reason I decided, I've worked in the publishing industry, like with my introduction for the past 15 years, you just don't make as much money. Um, if you can reach the same amount of people 
Um, I'm not saying you're going to. I'm just saying that if you have the outlet to reach the same amount of people as you would with the publisher, there is no reason in my mind to go with the publisher. You have access to the same type of editing. You have access to the same type of publicity. Now there are there are perks to going to with a traditionally uh, with a traditional press, and one of those big perks is you and you can you know you Walmart. Barnes and Noble, distribution. So the distribution is a huge thing that you cannot do. But like I said, if you have the if you have the capability to reach those outlets by yourself, there's no reason not to. So I did it. Um, I've been successful, but the uh, I was telling him before we uh, well, before we got started here, one of the main reasons why I've been successful is because of the audiobook industry. Um, I don't make I make pennies on the dollar for uh, my ebooks and my paperbacks. But with my audiobooks, I make 40% of the net sale, and usually the audiobooks are anywhere from $25 to $70, depending on the length of, the, the length of it. Um, with my ebooks, I don't charge more than 3 to $5 for each one. I make 70% off that, but if anybody do the math, I obviously make more money off of the, the audiobooks. That's how I've been able to uh, reach the, be able to reach a professional writer status as an indie um, by doing it that way with the audiobooks, that's basically what pays the bills. And I support a family of four uh, only on the independent publishing side. Well, that's there you go. interesting. I'm almost the opposite of who you are, yeah. When I first came into trying to get my works published, there wasn't this wonderful explosion of avenues where you could do it. It just wasn't done. And if you did self-publish, it was called Vanity Press. And I don't remember that now. Your only choice was to see if you could go with the traditional publishers. And I did the whole thing, you know, like sending out, getting rejections, and trying again. You know, it was a huge, we had this huge machinery in place for unpublished authors of, you know, letting each other know about the various venues. And my whole life. I was finishing my doctorate and getting a job as a professor, and everything in the back of my mind was always, you know, what, what can I get published? So they're all on the right. Well, I was fortunate when I, um, <coughs> I went to interviews for the job at Kenya College. They were very smart. I got a lot of interviews because, you know, I'm considered, you know, a pretty good teacher, but also I was a woman in science and I weren't a lot, so there were a lot of departments looking for, you know, scientists. <laughs> And then I had, you know, the, one of the best pieces of writers in the country, actually in the world. So he helped me get a lot of interviews. And what got me, you know, they also, we can offer you this, and we, you know, this money and that salary. Kenny College was smart. They said, we're going to have you talk to Joan Swanzuski in the bio department. I said, why? He said, she's published all the before. <laughs> Kenny got me because of that. That's the reason they got me. Because I really liked John, we had a lot of common, and sure enough, when I got there, we started, you know, with friends, meeting for lunch, and one day she said, I understand you're sending out your book, and I look at it, I have a, a, a award winning, and I didn't want anything so far, I didn't have anything published, to have an award winning, one of the top in the field, especially, she's considered very scholarly, you know, literary, science fiction. So I said, okay, and she read it. But she read the last talk. It was, like, you know, it was about rollovers, and so we also had feminism and columnists. So she said, "I'm going to recommend you to my editor." And in those days, that was the only way in. Somebody either opened the door, or or you you got in the slush. And it was like you know, two thousand people sent stories to Animal that month, and it took days. Stan Schmidt, the editor, went out and found me. But the time, and I actually didn't get that many rejections compared to some people who paper the wall under something. You know, I got about 10. And then before people started saying, oh, you like the way you write, send us something else. About the same time that David Hartwell said, I'm thinking I want to publish your book. I would like you to write a short story for me for an anthology. About that same time, Stan Schmidt said, well, not this one, but I kind of like what we did with it, and if you fix it, you can send it back. 
And David wanted to see how it took editorial. David was one of the best editors in the country. And that's why he wanted me to write the short story. And I think, I think the same was true this time. So I did what they each wanted. I was very open to the editorial input. And they both published me about the same time. It was in mid-1990s. Um, at that time, there was no other way to distribution. You know, now, you know, we have these geniuses who figure out how to do it for themselves. At that time, there was no web, or it was just being born. So there was no way. Either they distributed, and you know, you would spend hours learning how this worked. You know, the distributor takes 50%. You know, the publisher needs to produce the book. They need to print it. Ebooks didn't exist. So, you know, by the time it got down to you, you know, you get 8% for a paperback, you get 10% for a hardback. And you could go through and see where all the money went. It made sense. So I've been, for most of my career, I've been traditionally published by Tor, which is part of the, the part of one of the big publishers, I forget mm -hmm. which one. Uh, Bain, which is signed with Simon Schuster Distribution. They've distributed all my books. Um, I got paid a lot better than initially people got paid for self-publishing when that started to open up. You know, I was getting five figures, right? Almost from the start. It actually went down a little bit when ebook publishing got big. What I was able to do for my first two books was keep the e publishing rights. Because the publishers didn't know that. How big it's going to be. And what he's doing is it makes a lot of sense. Keep as many rights as you can. My fourth book, it was from Tor, and there's this big paragraph that had been added in. It was clearly an add in to the war report that said, we own any electronic advice ever to be invented. <laughs> you know, it was like, we want the whole shebang <coughs> and the baby in the I went to my agent and I said, no. No, no, they can't take, they're trying to take everything. She said, well, I don't know you. What's going to be good? So they kind of take it all. I said, no. She had Catherine to do it. You don't take it, they won't take it. Because that's when they're starting to quit what is going to happen. Okay, since then, I've made more money on the three books that I've kept my own rights to for ebook publishing than I've made on, you know, combined. Because the publishers came in and said, all right, you get 8% on your ebook. Because, you know, we gave you 8%. This may be well be nice, we gave you 10%. I'm like, no. <laughs> you know, this book, you have to produce this book. It costs money, especially if they bring me on hardcover too, that costs even more money. You have to distribute it, you have to ship it, you have overhead, you have to give it to distributors who then give it to the bookstores, they take 50%. So okay, you know, you can show me 10%. You don't gotta do anything with the ebook. I said I want 70% of the ebook. It's like, haha. You know, it takes them five minutes to, to turn it into the file. Yeah. Done. yeah. Right. And you're like, I mean 25%. I get 70% you know, of the ebooks I publish myself. For audiobooks, all my audiobooks sold to the, the big audiobook publishers. And then I had one that they didn't want. It was uh, an anthology from a small press called, uh, it was an Illinois science fiction press, because I was a guest of honor at Lindy Hall. And uh, my agent said they don't want it. And I said, well, I'll go on the, do you use ACX? Yes. Yeah, yeah. ACX. Yeah, if you want to do an audio book, go to ACX. They do everything for you. You have to publish it, I think, if I remember correctly, as an e-book first. Mm -hmm. And if it's your first publication, you own the rights. Until you sign that contract, you do what you want with it. So you publish it yourself, and then you go through the process, and like he was describing, you either get someone and you read it yourself, and then you get most of the royalties. So I still get a lot more from my e-books through the big publishers. But just with that one book that almost no one's heard of, I do, I do get a good amount each month. And I'm going to start doing more. So I'm going to now you have so many options for publishing that didn't exist when I started. I will, you know, one thing he didn't say, but you could probably get from what he was saying. You do it yourself. It's a lot of work. You can do well if you're willing to put in the work. I was going to mention when you're talking about all the stuff that they do for you, I have to do all of that. The distribution, the mailing, all, all that stuff. Promotion. Yeah, all the promotion, all that stuff is either out of my pocket or I have to do it myself. Physically, I have to show up places. It's all.
small, you know, ambient tighter company. And if you're doing it yourself, you're not right. Yeah. Exactly. While you're doing production. <coughs> Somehow I, I managed to, to balance to balance both. Well, it's kind of like an afternoon hobby for me, and, you know, building everything up. Well, yeah, for me, it all started really at science fiction conventions. Because I, before I started writing, I would go to conventions and give talks about space and space exploration and science. And I had a lot of people tell me at that time that I, I have the ability to explain complicated things so people can understand them. And I, I do that a lot. I, I talk to management at work, sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I would do that, and I'd have people come up and say, you ought to write, a, you know, write this down, maybe you can be whatever, and I hear it a lot over and over and over again. And finally, uh, a good friend of mine who had written some nonfiction, we had an idea for a nonfiction book called Living Off the Land in Space, about how to use the resources of space to sustain exploration. And he said, Les, I've published with nonfiction popular science before, would you like to write a book with me? And I thought, well, that sounds like a fun thing to do. I always wanted to write a book. So we wrote a proposal, and the publisher said, sure. This other fellow, Greg Matloff, was his name. He, he had a track record with him. He said, we'll publish the book. So the book came out, and as, as, as actually before we finished it, as we were writing it, uh, we sent them another proposal for another book, and they said, well, let us see how far you are on this first one. And they liked the second one, so I got another contract, right, before we even finished the first one. So it was a very traditional route, but I lucked into it with the publisher. Um, that publisher was Springer, and I've done a couple of books with them, and they're popular science now. They do a lot of textbooks. But they don't have much of a distribution network. It's very much a, a library distribution network, very limited exposure kind of book. And their popular science books do show up at Barnes & Noble, and you can get them on Amazon and book. But they're really, they don't pay much, and it's a very uh, niche publisher. Well, about that same time, I, I, as I said, I go to science fiction conventions. I have a, a good friend named Travis Taylor, who had been published by Bain Books, science fiction, space adventure kind of story. And he and I were in a discussion at a barbecue place in Huntsville, Waller's Barbecue. And we were, I, if you can tell by my voice, I'm not exactly a quiet, shy or sort of kind of person who sits in the corner and can't hear, and neither is Travis. In fact, he makes me look shy. And so we were complaining about how my employer, by the way, I'm not here representing NASA this weekend, this is an off the record comment. If you watch NASA TV, it's a snoozer, right? I mean, it is, right? It's the most exciting adventure in the history of the species and the most dangerous thing we do is get on a rocket and go into space. I mean, you've got engines that are draining Olympic sized swimming pools for liquid hydrogen in 60 seconds and combust with oxygen and getting millions of pounds of thrust. And you've got people riding on top praying with them, whatever. I mean, it's just amazing. And what you hear on NASA TV is everything's nominal. <laughs> yeah. and, and so we were complaining about how that then really it's the greatest adventure story since Jack London of, of, of you know human versus nature kind of thing because space is out to kill you. Well, Tony Weisskopf, who's the publisher of Bain, Travis's publisher. Yeah, she was in the booth next door and she leaned over and said, send me a proposal for a fiction novel that's the next, you know, uh, Jack London kind of thing only in space and I might buy it. <laughs> so, you know, we, we did that, and, we, and my first science fiction novel, which is Back in the Moon, and it sold well enough that we did a sequel called On the Asteroid, and I've published uh, four now, this is my fourth novel. Uh, Travis and I have a contract for a series of three books that we're working on for Betty, and I've since left Springer, thank goodness, because they're a poor distribution network, and I went the conventional route for my nonfiction book, I got an agent, and I got many rejection letters. But I, I landed an agent at Fine Print Literary Management, and she has been wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. She is responsible for this book happening on this material called Graphene, and she actually came to me with the book idea that she had developed with uh, Random House. This is from these books, where they said, we want a book on this topic, you have a wider view of it. And so that's how I ended up getting a contract for this book, which came out this year. And so for me, I've gone very much, I lucked into getting my novel published. I will freely admit you can hit me with baseball bats later, but I got lucky, all right? But I've since signed with an agent, and, and she has been worth her weight in gold to me, and landed better contracts and yeah. new work that I never would have gotten. And, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. 
I was just going to say one thing. So there's a book I recommend that if you want to go the traditional route, it's called Putting Your Passion Into Print. And it'll walk you through the process of how to appropriately go find an agent and get published. So that you, if you don't want to go the self-published route, and you want to go the traditional route, you don't have to figure it all out on your own how to do it. This book gives you kind of a recipe. It's assuming you're a good writer, though. It's not going to sell you what you want. But it's going to tell you what to do, how, how to write a query letter, how to tailor it for the agent, how to find the right agent for the kind of book that you want to have published. And I recommend that book very highly. I didn't write the book. Yeah, it's, it's that's, how, that's how I got published. I got books. There was one out at the time written by the editors of Asimov's, which was before the onset of electronic magazines. There was only Asimov's and a lot of and, um, fantasy and science fiction, and for a while I said, those were pretty much your only professional markets. So the editors of Asimov's got together and wrote a book about you know, everything to do. And then I would get you know, various books like From Writer's Digest. So ironically, the few times I wrote the unspoken words, there were a whole bunch of books out there. Like Stan Schmidt, I sent him something, which later became the Lord of the And I sent it to him. He said, well, I like a lot about this, but it's not quite right. He sent me something else. So I sent him Light and Shadow. And I forgot to say, if, if an editor ever says to you, you know, this is not quite right for me, then send me something else. That's a big deal. You don't get that unless they genuinely think that they publish you. Well, I didn't put him my thing. You asked me to send you, you know. And at that time, they had slush reader. There's still even the e-magazines had slush reader. And so I went to the slush reader. He decided, my next one, he decided, you know, well, I don't think we're going to see this. So it never made it back to Spain. So I was pissed off. He, was, then he asked me to send him more. So I wrote a letter. I sent it back. I wrote this letter saying, well, you asked me to send you a you know, thing, and here's, here's why you, you're going to like this. And explained all this stuff to that, you know, I came back to basically said, I came up with this really clever idea of circumventing the problems that feel like I'm a physicist, so I know I'm about <laughs> This is my idea. You should move this and you asked me to send it to you, right? But I was more polite than that. But that broke every rule because you're not supposed to do that. They don't want to see long letters. The classic thing is, you know, the writer go, oh, my mother's dying. Here's a scenario. <laughs> yeah, right. The cover letter is longer than the story. Yeah. Right? And that's an automatic rejection. Well, I was lucky. I was lucky Stanchman was actually interested specifically in the thing I was writing about. And he himself had written a book about you know, using the physics of the speed of light. So he wrote me back and he said, okay, I'll take you know, kind of like, all right, I'll take your challenge. This story, as it is, will not, you know, it's not, I, I wouldn't accept it. But if you do this, 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 you may send it back. And that became like a shadow of my first story. That's one of the first stories I've ever had. There's something to be said also, it's been brought up twice so far, if you notice, there's a special word here, luck. There, there's a lot of luck in this business period, finding your readership, maintaining your readership, finding a publisher. There's a lot of luck. So on top of being talented, talented and having the uh, everything that you need, you know, the, the grammar, the, the education, all that stuff, luck comes into play a lot with this also. So you can write the best book in the world, but if nobody looks at it, if you're not lucky enough to get in, get it to somebody, or lucky enough to find a good agent to get it in with somebody, then you're still, you know. I don't think you. luck is anywhere as good. Yeah. No, we're not going to let you win. You're not just lucky. You work. Oh, no, no, no. I'm saying it's the... the but, well, no, let me finish. Okay. So I was using you. Sorry. Yeah, we make our luck. You know, it's true that I didn't get a lot of rejections, but that wasn't luck. That was because I spent hours and hours, days, planning. You know, I accepted a job offer based not on that it was the best university that offered me a job, but because it had John Sanzuski, who was published by four. I mean, everything, you know, I made my work. And I, I did research, and I found who would be a good publisher for the books. I learned, I went and read book after book about what are they looking for. So, yeah, I didn't get a lot of rejections, 
I'm definitely, I'm, I'm not discounting, you know, the, the talent or the hard work putting in, but a lot of it, getting it in front of the right person, and you can be super talented, you can put in all the work. I know that there's guys in the business that have, that finally went to self-publishing because, and this, getting good books, but nobody will read them. They're just not getting to the right people. They're not getting past, like you said, the slush, the acquisition editors, or the slush pile readers. But they that's the thing about getting an out. They still have, but they, but they still have an angle going. Even doing self-publishing. Well, I've been lucky. I'll tell you about that. I've been lucky. I was lucky with the audio books taking me off. Um, there's a lot of luck coming into play. But a lot of luck comes into play in everyday life. You know, whether or not you get the job that you want. I think you're down I want to hear from uh, Dr. Colin Brown first. That was my first uh, professional comic writing. And then when you decide to move from comics to prose, it doesn't matter how good a comic writer you are, it doesn't count. It's, they're completely different types. And so, yes, I had good selling comics and publishers of, of novels for like, we didn't care. Can you write a novel? So I started out in comics. Um, when I wrote my first novel, I was, was also back when if you self-published, it was vanity and it was very much looked down on. There was only submitted two publishers uh, or get an agent, uh, which I attempted to do. I, I, have, I sold my first novel in 2004. I've been querying agents since 2000 when I wrote it, and yet to find one. I, I have been published over a hundred times, from publishers that are small press, so if you have done myself, two like big New York publishing houses. But yeah, I still cannot find an agent that I work with them. I have actually had agents tell me, even looking at all the stuff that was that published, that my work's not selling. Huh. Uh, it's sold. I think it's sold. Yeah, I have, it's one of those weird things. So I, I wrote my first novel, and I, I found a publisher. It took me six years of, of Reading publishers to I found one. It turned out to be an awful, awful experience. Uh, but I had a book. I had a book in my hand. And I used that book to talk to, talk to other publishers. Because they, didn't, they don't know about the behind the scenes crap that was going on. But, you know, but I had a book. And when you talk and you're going into being new, you know, new editors and new publishers, you, you know, say, Hi, I'm a writer. And they go, Oh, well, what have you written? Well, I'm working on my first, and you can see the glaze, yeah. you know. But if you go up and say, I have a writer, oh, what have you written? And you go, oh, here, you put a book in their hand. First thing they're going to do is they're going to go over, back. You've bought yourself a minute. And if that's enough to enter from you at least, you know, bought yourself a, a minute or two to, to make your pitch or whatever. Um, but having the first book, I, I was doing a convention. I had, because I was doing conventions because I had the conference. So I have all my comics out, and I, I had my new novel out. I'm so excited about my new novel. It, had, it came out like a week before the convention. It's really cool. I'm so excited. Sitting next to me, this is where the luck thing comes in. Yeah. Sitting next to me was a writer who was starting up his own imprint at a publisher doing uh, pulp. They were doing a pulp revival of old pulp characters. And he went home. He bought a copy of my novel. Two weeks later, I get an email. Hey, I read your book, liked it. You would be perfect for this. Are you interested? And after I had explained to me what pulp writing was, <laughs> um, I started doing that. So that led to, even though it was a crappy, crappy experience for me on the personal level, it led to the next book, which then led to other books, which led to other publishers. And then you can use, so, so even though I started out with this very small press thing, eventually, do get the notice of bigger publishers who then sometimes will come to hire you or, or come to you. The coolest thing is when a publisher that you've never worked for will can call you up and go, hey, we saw you did this and we liked it. How would you like to pitch us something? Or do you have something for us? How would you pitch to us? And so getting that invite, you know, is a big deal. Kind of like you said when they when they ask you to, to resend something else. And yeah, anytime the publisher comes to you and, and asks for anything without you prodding them or begging them or bribing them or uh, whatever, you know, it's, it's a big a deal. It's, yeah, it's a big deal. 
And so you, you, I took the, the small press route and used that, even though there wasn't a lot of money in doing those anthologies. I, I kind of started out doing those anthologies for a couple of years. It built up my resume. When you saw me at cons, I had a table full of books. You know, it was kind of that perception. It's busy, you know, you need a table full of books. And that also allows you to play in different genres, which sometimes helps you later down the road when the publisher says, can you write crime fiction? Yes, I can. See, I've done it here. And so using that kind of led me to use that as kind of the steps to lead me to where I am now. And then, you know, I'm still, I still agent hunt from time to time. It's still very demoralizing. And I do it until I'm fed up and I say, screw them, and I'll try again next year. And, um, but I, I get enough work without the agent that it's not as big a deal for me as it used to be. I would probably make more money if I had an agent. I'd probably get bigger publishers. But you know, that's the, the, the frustration and hassle. Is and in recent years, I have started adding self-publishing to, to, my, to my list. Um, I, uh, this particular book here, I self-published. Um, I started doing, I sold, Originally, the first one, it was originally sold to a publisher that was just going to do ebooks. They didn't want the print rights. They sold me the print rights. They let me keep the print rights, the audio rights, everything. They put out the first ebook, and then three years passed, and nothing happened. So I finally got my rights back on the contract, you know. So I started just doing it on myself because of the size. Instead of reformatting it and reconfiguring it, I already had planned and already written some of them. So I started doing them myself as. This is a collection of three, so they're smaller, and I can release a couple throughout the year. And, uh, so I started self-publishing. I, excuse me, started going through my back list of stuff I've written ten years ago in an anthology. And hey, I've got three, I've got three sci-fi stories. I collect those three sci-fi stories in one book and self-publish that and kind of keep my back list going. So, so I guess I fall in that hybrid because I still work for publishers and then do my stuff and kind of like juggle it and, and slide. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so I can go fast. Uh, I'd like to know how y'all promote your books. Any way you can. <laughs> That's hard. Um, that hard. Yeah. I, uh, I use specifically Book Club. Um, there, you, you put your book on sale for 99 cents or $1.99 or whatever it is. Um, they're rather difficult nowadays to get into. Um, you have to build a following first, which is kind of uh, kind of backward, uh, because you're trying to get a following. You're trying to you know sell your book, but now you have to have a certain amount of followers before they even let you run an ad. Um, I will do that. I also have a YouTube channel where I promote my stuff on there, um, but that's pretty much it. I run sales through BookBub. Um, BookBub's huge. That's why they're harder to get into now, um, and Social media. I mean, that's really, that's really it. As far as, and of course, I talk about it every time, anytime I can. That's my promotion side of it. The traveling to conventions, joining writing groups, uh, asking your local library would they like you to come in and talk. Uh, I have a, two Facebook pages. One which is a public figures page, which uh, my fans started and then they did. And I have a personal page, which isn't really a personal page, because it's all my fans before I have the public figures. And so I hit the limit. We have 5,000 people still. So then we started, you know, it started spilling over the public figures page, which has no limit. You can, uh, you know, post whatever you want. If you want to reach more people, you can boost the post, which, you know, it's true you pay for the ads, but they're pretty low. I mean, I, I often will pay, like, you know, 40, 50 bucks to boost the book about my post and it's thousands of people on the other and they're happy. You can pick your audience, target it to people that would like, you know, what you write. So you can say people who put up the tag science fiction, space it, that sort of thing. You can know there's lots of social media sites like Facebook, Twitter, is a short, you know, real short thing. It used to be on 40, I think it's long. You know, you can talk about your book. You learn how to interact with fans. Instagram's another one. Where you're not constantly promoting, but with, you're talking to people and telling, you know, posting pictures of your cat, you know, 
people get to know you, so they join and you build up, you know, thousands. You can potentially get thousands, tens of thousands. Some celebrities have millions of followers. So when they put up a post, I have this post coming up, millions of people see it. I don't have that many, I have tens of thousands. But it's still, LinkedIn's another one where you can reach people at a more professional level. If you're writing like, uh, popular science or more esoteric science, because I have mainstream, you know, big five publishers, they will help me organize tours. I still have to, they don't pay for all that. I still often have to pay to travel to the convention I'm going to. You know, we'll pay it, we're, like they pay to bring me to this one. You know, but if you can make a, um, combine things together and books coming out, you can generally do affordable promotion of those. And you get to meet people. And, you know, I, I have friends that I started that I meet at, you know, conventions that you know them for years. It's a community that you can get to look at. Science fiction is a community more than a fantasy and more than I think many other genres. And when she may get out in the community, that in itself is, it's not just prom promotion, it's being part of something that's a lot of fun. Word of mouth is very valuable. And it's still one of the best promotional tools you'll we'll ever have. If you can please one person and they can tell somebody else, I and mean, that's, that's really the best. Because people don't like, I mean, care about an ad. If you get something like, I just read the book, buddy, and it's amazing. So word of mouth is still very strong. And, and what you about doing, I mentioned meeting people. Um, how many times have, has your perception of someone's work changed because you met them and they were so nice that now you enjoy their work more? And the opposite works too. Yeah. I mean, I have like people who's work I love and turn out to be jerks, and I can't not think about that whenever I read their work. I go, yeah, he's a jerk. Well, there's a direct correlation for me when I go to a convention. If I'm only on panels, I sell fewer books. If I give one of my solo talks about space or space exploration or whatever, I sell a ton of books. And so I really try when I go to the con these days to try to give yeah. solo talks because that's when I engage with conference and talk. Which, if you recall, is why people started asking you to write a book to begin with, right? And so it shouldn't be surprising. And That's you're entertaining. I mean, I mean you're, you're entertaining. A you physicist who's entertaining. <laughs> 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 you know, you know, when you oh, I've got some I've seen you. 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 I've I'm leading a mission to an asteroid with a solar sail. It's not of the caliber of the end of the nature. They reviewed this book. I got a part of in nature. An excerpt was published in American Scientist, which is awesome. This book's being promoted by the Graphene Society, Graphene Materials Society of America. In fact, the book, when a book comes out, you get the spike in sales at the beginning. Sorry, friends are like that, right? And your fans <laughs> to buy the book. And then the sales kind of dribble off. Well, as soon as this went in nature, there was a spike. American scientists, there was a bigger spike. And then uh, there was, I forgot what the podcast was, some podcast had a thing on graphene. And there was a little short interview with my co-author of this book. And it has spiked higher than the release one. And so it's just interesting, I'm a scientist, I look at correlation, right? To, to look at the correlation between when it gets a little bit of press and the yeah. bump in sales they have. The, the, important, the important thing there too is that the difference between publishing then and publishing now? Publishing as many as much as 20 years ago, when they ran out of, I don't know how many they printed, but they printed 100,000. When that 100,000 were gone, your book was gone. <laughs> unless, yeah. it, unless it was at a huge bookstore. Now, your 100,000 sales, they make it print on demand, so if anybody else wants it, that book will be available. Years from I like the sound of 100,000. <laughs> <laughs> this has good, good, and not good ramifications. Yeah, there's so much about that we haven't touched on. Yeah, they used to have 100,000 print ones. Don't give them no, like that them. because so many people buy on ebooks. But the bad part, it's nice that they stay in, in print longer, but the bad thing is, used to be your book could go out of print after three or four years. You know, often I would get something that's publisher, they say, well, we've got 800 books left in the, the warehouse, it's going out of print, we're going to throw them out, you want to buy them for a dollar book, and then I buy you know, 500 books, so I know I have to buy them for dollars and then sell them for $10 each. And then the book would be mine. 
I could do whatever I wanted. Oh, no and if they didn't go out of print, there was usually a clause in your contract that said, once it stops selling, once they're done, if they don't pay you again to you know, reprint the book and bring it out again, they have to give it back. That was standard in the clause. Now they are perpetually in print. And this hit me with this one book was selling like two trade paperbacks a year at Phantom Hill Way. And he said, well, your book's still in print. That's where you're doing your research and your publishers and all that. You have to know that. I mean, it's just the nature of the nature. Right, because it's kind of the nature of the business now. Yeah, there's a lot of people. It's Tor will not give me back the rights. Well, even, but, but even, even print books. I mean, now, I've not worked with Tor or Bank, <coughs> but I work with, like, with publishers that even when their initial print run or whatever it was is done, they will make the book available print on demand. So if someone wants a print copy, buy it. That's what happened to them. Yeah. Tor, I think, has rights to everything I've ever written. I will say, they're still selling a few of them, but I don't get a lot of royalties. And I want to rewrite. You know, the nice thing about ebooks, you can rewrite if you're better writer and you can read it and you can it. I can't do that because Tor's got all the rights and most of that. I will say, I, I don't do that as much as I probably should. I, I feel I feel like a jerk if I'm going to put something out there and uh, I've, got, I've become a better writer. It's like, if I update it, um, all those people who buy it to begin with don't get the better material. So uh, if I'm going to rewrite it, I would unpublish that one and completely rewrite it. And it like, offers a preferred edition how they do it. Well, there are second editions. A couple of those have gone in the second yeah. edition where you add new material and that gives you an opportunity to rewrite it. Okay. So you could, but it's clearly labeled the second edition. Yeah, I, did, I did that with the first book, which was so uh, a horrible experience. When my, when my contract ended, I was like, you know we're done. And I self-published it myself to get back out there. And I made a few tweaks and whatnot. But, but was it horrible? It was horrible for a lot of reasons. They were hard to deal with. They, they didn't know what they were doing in a lot of cases. They were very unprofessional. And they're, they're not around. Exactly when something is seeing a spike. 
So if I want to continue that spike and I want to try and push it, I can go buy an ad somewhere or I can do another rush specifically for that book, whereas with the publisher you may not get the news that it's selling well right then, you're going to miss that bubble of activity. Yeah, they don't want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. You're all, so. When it comes time to negotiate for a new book, all of a sudden you're their worst song. <laughs> <laughs> You can, you can see what right. they're doing. And, and there's a self-feeding monster there. Because as your sales rank drops, which is a good number, but a lower number of sales rank, right? The higher number, the closer to one, I mean, that's a better, right? Um, but there's, there's a, they, they promote you more. And you get more places they place you. So there's kind of a self-fulfilling you know, prophecy there. And so you want that momentum. Mm -hmm. Because it brings that sales, that, that book scan sales number. Because if you get it to, to the right. I think it's 20, 25 reviews, you get 25 reviews, they put you in this thing where they start comparing you, where it's like, if you like this, you'll like this. See, buddy, I've, I've, heard, I've heard this, I've, I've heard the, the magical numbers, the 25, the 15, the 100, yeah. but I have a book that has 14 reviews, it outsells everything I have, and it, it, it pops up in newsletters. I honestly believe that Amazon cares more about the sale of what's selling as oh, yeah. opposed to I'm the sure. reviews. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, but, but, but if you get the reviews, those two. Because the one that I have is I have 104 reviews on it, and I know this is probably small numbers for you guys, but 104 reviews on it, um, and one that's like 54 uh, reviews on it, that 14 review one outselling both of them is popping up all over the place. So I don't, I don't know. I've never. Um, uh, the only reason I'm bringing this up, I've never actually seen the proof that a certain number of reviews help, but re reviews do help. I, I, I can only say that Amazon told me that's what would happen. Okay. I, I, do, I have to believe that they're not lying to me. <laughs> See, it depends. If you're a new writer, it depends on how much you have and how much you want. Like, I, I don't look at I just got, I stopped the sales page, I get my bank account. I well, did it basically will. See, I can't, if I were to do that, I don't think I could buy it. I think I'd get like all I mean, I look at the sales rank and I don't read the book books. Well, I, I, like, that, that was advice. <coughs> right. It seems like um, a lot of food. longevity in terms of your endurance and loss. Stubbornness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stubborn. And just also getting out and talking to people. So I hope. But this has been an interesting conference, and we are out of time. Obviously, this is something we can talk about for an hour. I, I know we didn't get to all the questions, but I think we all have tables, right? Yes, we have tables. Feel free to come by and look at our stuff and ask questions. Look at our stuff. Buy our stuff. Buy our stuff. Buy our stuff.